Coming up on Techzilla, Veronica's budget gaming PC is running. Will it allow her to crush her foes? What part of your PC is most likely to fail first? Puget System John Bach joins us, and the answer might surprise you. How to hack Dropbox onto a thumb drive and a stack of your viewer questions all coming up. So flame up that wok and stir fry some General Chang's chicken, because Techzilla starts now. This episode of Techzilla is made possible by Mass Effect 2. Go to Assist Express and Squarespace. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Veronica Belmont. Welcome to Techzilla. Hands-on reviews of the latest tech and how to make the most out of the gear that you've already got. Whether you're a beginner, tech support for your friends and family, if you've got a question about tech, or the awesomest fungi in World of Warcraft, it's, I'll give you a clue, it's in Zanger Marsh. We've got an answer for you. <laughs> we do, and if we don't, we'll track down somebody who does. Are you excited? I know, it's I've been here. doing my little happy gaming PC dance for the last few it's couple quiet. weeks. It is like nice and quiet. We should point out, Veronica's older nice system. Nice and quiet. You didn't get a chance to hear it on set, but it had the old school like nine fans it on had, it. I had six fans. I'm pretty sure I had six it fans. It blew your hair back when you it were gaming. It was like a jet engine taking off. Wow. It was ridiculous. You could hear it from all the way on the other side of the apartment. It would drive Ryan crazy. I could never game when he was working because it would totally distract him from whatever he was trying to get done. And so now I've got a and nice quiet. He can't type with headphones on, right? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> it was always hard for me to talk to my to my friends on Ventrilo too because right. I'd be trying to like, you know, work through the raid and he's like, "Can you just be quiet for like half an hour while I finish this?" And I'm like, "Got a raid. Sorry, <laughs> buddy. It's scheduled. We're on the clock." The question that we're going to answer, right? Cuz the benchmarks are run mm -hmm. is is actually whether or not it's going to give you the competitive advantage over Mr. Chang Left 4 yes. Dead 2. That was one of the the big questions. Yes. And he was running crisis on it. He was read, running Crisis on it. That's kind of the, the standard benchmarking game. It's so the we, game we from put it hell on there. To run these days. Yeah, mm. I, it's funny. It's not even that new at this point. It's still like the standard. Well, a lot they, of people they, use Lich King also as a benchmarker. I've seen. Well, there's. I mean, yeah, there's. You can benchmark. I mean, I'm you sure somebody's come up with the World of Warcraft benchmark. Oh, of but, course. You know, oh, tons. Yeah. You'd be able to run it much faster than you'd actually be able to see the action, probably. Well, it is. It is very, very <laughs> scalable, as I've said multiple right. times. So any kind of system can pretty much run World of Warcraft. It may not be able to be cranked up to the like top of the line graphic stuff and, At least and not shadowing and shading. Up everybody and, in your apartment building, right? Of the but fans. It, it can be done on a pretty <laughs> low end machine, and which is what I did for the past year. Right. So now I've got a nice little nice little upgrade here. You can put music in the background or something while yeah. you're playing. Yeah. Wow. Oh, and hey, uh, speaking of upgrades, Apple had mm. their big announcement on on Wednesday. We tape on Monday, so unfortunately we can't look into the future to see what happened yet. You will see this after the fact. So hopefully it was something awesome. I just want a new. MacBook Pro. So. We, we got all Eddie Kovacs and did the miracle of time travel. Roger and I skipped off to the Yerba Buena Center for the Arts Theater in San Francisco Wednesday morning to see what the tech pundits on the list, those are the people who got to go inside and see the announcement, had to say about the latest creation from La Apple. Ladies and gentlemen, we're here at Apple's event January 27th. There was an iPad and nothing else. Mr. Laporte, are you excited? I think in some ways, uh, this is Apple saying we are creating a new category. I think that's, that's kind of what I expected mm -hmm. from Apple. And they've done it uh, with their usual uh, flair, their elegance, their sense of design. Uh, they've, it's interesting, I mean, they didn't even use anybody's third-party CPU. They made their own CPU for this. I don't even know where to start in on that. I gotta, I, I mean, I gotta ask you one question for the, before we start talking about Apple being a CPU manufacturer <laughs> for the second time in their life for yeah. all intents and purposes. Are you gonna buy one? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's no question. Aren't you? 3G or, or are you gonna no, buy no, a Wi-Fi? I can't wait 90 days. I'm buying one in 60 days. Are you kidding? 3G? No, I, and, and I have a MiFi, so I'm not going to worry about 3G. I think a lot of people won't need 3G. I mm -hmm. think Wi-Fi's everywhere, and Wi-Fi's fast. Wi-Fi is practically free. Why not just go with Wi-Fi? I, 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 20 bucks says you buy two of them. Eh, you might be right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I, I really think that the low-end one, at 499 for 16 gigs with Wi-Fi only, is actually pretty compelling product. That's going to replace my Kindle mm -hmm. on day one. Really? Oh, yeah. You're going to drop your Kindle? Absolutely. And all of your Kindle Did books? Did you go in there or are you going to run the, Well, you're going to run the Kindle app on there. Yeah, it felt, I was actually shocked. The, the interface feels awesome. The screen is gorgeous. 
the photos look great on it. The, I want it. I, I, I want it right now just to use the the the, the Google Maps in my truck. Yeah. Like it, like it, it looks like the perfect navigational tool. It's like a, you know it's and it probably for people who do GIS except for the fact that it's on a Windows platform. There's people who are probably sitting there going like it's perfect. Yeah. It's the perfect tool. No, it'd be interesting to see if there's a vertical market. But I think this is definitely a mass market product that's going to have a tough sell initially because it's a new category. People say, well, I have a laptop or I have a phone. I, I don't even know what this is. Do I need it? But as soon as they go to an Apple store and they have this experience, I think they're going to, I think they're going to buy them. I think what Apple's done here is very significant. I think they've gone from being another flavor of computer to a new device and there is no equivalent. And I think in some ways, what Apple's done here is truly remarkable. They've actually created a new category. This is what they actually. You're saying this is my new jetpack. This is this is Star Trek. Yeah, and I think that people are going to be using the, the thing that's unique about this is it gets out of your way 100%. That's what we always wanted with technology is that the technology gets out of right. your way so you can use it in a natural fluid way. And I think this is the first device I've seen really does that. I think the man is gone mystical on us. He is in <laughs> love, Mr. Laporte. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you, Pat. Lance Ewellnoff, PCMag.com, one of our favorite, favorite, favorite technology writers has been hands-on inside. Is it is it sacrosanct in there? Is it, you know what I mean? Is it's, it to well, have that? Apparently it's magical. Because really? I just kept saying it's magical. The device is magical, the experience is magical. It is it is actually a very sexy device. It looks good, it feels good, it seemed responsive. Mm -hmm. Nice big 1024 by 768 screen. Graphics, everything looks really, really good on it. And you know, the comment that Steve Jobs made about 75 million people already knowing how to use it, he's exactly right. It's basically it's exactly the same. There's your homepage, there are your icons. If you want to get back to it, hit the button at the bottom, just like on an iPhone. No camera, which I'm surprised about. No stylus, which I'm sad about. Mm -hmm. But um, it seems like they are, they're really using the multifunction in there. By the way, he didn't mention something. He showed this off to me. There's a compass built into it. He showed me an application that lets you look at the night sky, mm -hmm. hold up, the tablet to the sky and it gives you this overlay of what you're looking at wherever you are. There's a couple, three really good applications out for yeah. the iPhone. Are you going to buy one? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Dude, thanks so much. Oh, no problem. You may remember him from the Stanford Laptop Orchestra, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Go Wang. What did you think? Are you buying an iPad? Definitely. I think we're going to buy about 20 of them. Really? As soon as we can. For the, for the mobile phone orchestra, for the laptop orchestra. Uh, I think this device is actually going to change a lot of things, uh, not just for a few people, but for a lot of people. Okay, you're obviously at the cutting edge of technology. Why do you think it's going to change things? I think it's really at a balance mm -hmm. that has power and intimacy. And uh, I think laptops to date are still, they're still very much required the user to go to its world, whereas the phone brings the computing out to our physical world, to our everyday lives. Now, I think the iPad is something that combines those where you have the immersiveness of the laptop, but you use it wherever you go, whenever you want. So it's really this combination of mobility and intimacy and power that all rolled up into one device. And we don't really have anything else out there like that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think it's gonna be a game changer on a lot of levels. What can you do on this in terms of, of the orchestra and some of the other projects that you can't do on a regular notebook? Um, all kinds of new instruments suddenly become feasible or possible. We can now design new interfaces, new instruments, um, new ways to actually interact with computing and sound synthesis. The big screen with multi-touch is actually going to change the way we use multi-touch mm -hmm. and change the way we actually use more traditional metaphors for interaction. And now we can actually go about designing for a whole new medium. Um, and I think we're just going to actually have all kinds of new instruments and new ex musical experiences. So it's, uh, I'm, I'm totally stoked. I loved it to hear that the uh, device actually will have 3G, which means you can have this anytime, anywhere connectivity, mm -hmm. um, as well as this great big multi-touch screen. It's, it's, I think I'm totally excited. It's so you are, yeah, you're actually bubbling at this point. Go, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Well, there you have it. So do you want one? I don't know yet. Aspie Wednesday. I know. Unfortunately, we can't look into the future. You know, you know how it goes. You, though, speaking of shiny new toys, this is decidedly not whatever <laughs> Apple announced on Wednesday. It's I your new it. PC. Yes, as you all know, last week we were waiting for Newegg to ship us the parts we ordered for my brand new gaming PC here. Well, they arrived late last week and we put the hustle on putting it together. 
Turns out the Thermal Take case was a better choice than we thought. Big and roomy with lots and lots of thumb screws. It's got a whole other extra panel here that we can add an extra fan if we so desire. So the machine is up and running. Let's take a look at how it runs. Now, one of the first things I did was check out the Windows Experience Index. Uh, yeah, not a real big yardstick to go on. And it really Woo! only gives you an inkling of how your machine will do in Windows. But out of morbid curiosity, I had to check. Um, so my old gaming PC, you know, the big jet engine one, um, was a little on the low side. I mean, the processor came in at 5.9, the RAM was 5.5, the graphics for both Arrow and the 3D came in at 6.9, and the hard disk at 5.2. So your overall rating, of course, then was a 5.2 because the Windows Experience Index is rated exactly to the lowest and slowest component in your 5 machine. 5.2, which is not so hot. Um, <laughs> en la machina nuevo, wait, el machino nuevo? I, I think it's... Oh, my Spanish is terrible. Um, I got a 7.2 for both Josh. CPU and RAM, um, a 7.4 <laughs> for graphics, and a 5.9 for the hard drive. Sure, there's only a 0.7 difference between the old and the new hard drive, but man, is everything else way up, and that makes me a happy little lady. But like I said, the Windows experience isn't like a really great yardstick to measure a gaming PC by, so we turn to something else. That's something else being, of course, Crisis. Yeah, it's a little over two years old at this point, but it still comes in handy. Now, we ran the Crisis CPU test at 1600 by 1200 with all the eye candy cranked up and the eight times anti-aliasing, but with VSync off. Um, my old machine managed to average out at about 15.38 frames per second. Um, my machine now managed to squeeze out 23.58 frames per second. That's about a 53% improvement. Um, when we ran the Crisis GPU test with the same settings, my old machine averaged uh, 15.68 frames per second, while my newer machine here scored 21.36 frames per second. Well, a smaller boost, but still a 36% increase. Not quite the 30 frames per second that we would, of course, like to see, but we kind of expected that with it being an entry-level gaming video card. So I Thank gotta, you. There was some furious downloading going on this afternoon, just so you could get the <laughs> hands-on time with World of Warcraft. Did you, did you, was it, was it, did it change? Obviously, your first-person shooter gaming has just changed dramatically. I think we have the Left for Dead competitive <laughs> advantage you were looking for. It'll help. I mean, I'm, I'm actually not sure what Roger's running. I know he's got a gaming laptop Roger's, that he uses, so. Roger's running 25. Roger's, Roger has more money tied up in his PC than I have tied up in my PC, and I've got at least $1,100 tied up in my PC now. It's the most expensive PC I've built in yeah, the last and decade. even in gaming PC terms, that's not a lot of money. Actually, twelve hundred dollars is a lot of money in gaming PC terms because both of us actually have SSD. Well, you know, twelve to fifteen hundred is actually you can build a lot of machine for twelve to fifteen hundred dollars, especially if you're not running an SSD drive, a solid state drive. Well. I think it's money well spent for me for spending six hundred dollars. I think we did pretty well for ourselves. I mean, some people in the forums had some suggestions on things we could have done a little bit differently, but you know. What, what would they like to see the most? Oh, I don't remember. You'll have to go ch check it up. There was like a couple <laughs> of posts about people being like, "Well, instead of doing this, you could have done this," and "Well, actually," and we're like, "Yeah, of course." There was a lot of different options when you're putting something together like this, but we picked the ones that we liked the best, and I, I'm happy with the result. And WoW looked great. I downloaded Wrath of Lich King today and I'm put it all together. I'm giggling because you guys can't see. It, but I can just see like your eyes. But I know the like, eye level right the... here. It's pretty funny. <laughs> it's pretty adorable. But You're like that. Like... What was that guy on Home Improvement's name? Wilson. Wil Wilson. Yeah, yeah, you look like Wilson from over there. <laughs> All right, well, anyhow, now that my gaming PC is all built, I need to start installing some games on this puppy, like our sponsor's Mass Effect 2. A sequel to the totally awesome space RPG Mass Effect, Mass Effect 2 follows the journey of Commander Shepard and his or her team as they seek to uncover who or what is behind the disappearances of entire human colonies. The odds are stacked against them, and Shepard's team isn't one that he can entirely trust. But if humanity is to be saved, Shepard and his crew must succeed in the fight for the lost. Having played through Mass Effect, uh, Mass Effect 2 has us totally stoked. From the visuals and fights to the super slick sci-fi atmosphere, Mass Effect 2 isn't just a game, it's an experience. So if you want to play the game that set the bar for space-based RPGs, you need to check out Mass Effect 2. It's out now for the Xbox 360 and PC. FYI, if you finish the first Mass Effect, keep your saved games. You'll be able to import them into Mass Effect 2, and then people will be like, oh hey, Shepard, how's it going? Remember me? You were a total jerk to me last time I saw you. Actually, not from, in my case, I always play good. I'm a sucker for it. Welcome to this week's freebie download pick, a free program that we find useful, fun, or incredibly interesting. This week, Core Temp. Monitoring the temperatures of the CPU and your PC is serious business. 
Doesn't matter if you're burning it in a DIY system or overclocking your current PC. A great application for that is CoreTemp. A no-nonsense application, it monitors the DTS, that's the digital thermal sensor, located in almost all modern CPUs. Unlike motherboard sensors, the DTS is actually located next to the core, giving you a more precise measurement of your CPU's temperature, not the motherboard temperature or the space in between the CPU and the motherboard or something, well, useless, kind of like that. No fancy widgets or benchmarking tools are built into this one, but if you need to keep an eye on how hot your CPU gets when you're running folding at home, overclocking, or testing out that new liquid cooling system, you will definitely want to have core temp running. Download it. It's free. Oilerverse PCs, a $16,000 workstation. Puget System gets a fair amount of attention on the internet for some odd projects, but the PC company John Box started in his garage back in 2000 as mostly about building quality machines one at a time. John's been keeping track of the parts that fail and the parts that last. There is some interesting info in there, folks. John, welcome to Techzilla. Great, yeah, thanks for having me. Oh, our pleasure. What's what's new up at Puget Systems these days? Oh, well, you know, it's, it's really an exciting time. It's been a great six months. Uh, we have Core i5, Core i3 now, um, the new ATI cards, and looking forward to Intel Fermi. A really amazing uh, jumps in performance and a lot of new products coming out the last few months. Have you basically, are people still buying Core 2 Duos or they all pretty much moved up to the Core i5? Yep, Core 2 Duos are all, all gone. I was surprised to see how fast they went, but we dropped uh, the last motherboard from our line here recently. Wow. And yeah, it's all Core i5, Core i3. We should probably start out. What single component? You guys basically, you get the RMAs, you get the service requests. What single component fails most often on PCs? It's heartbreaking to say, but it's the motherboard. It's the most frustrating part of your computer to have fail. <laughs> um, we see almost double the failure rate than we see in any other category. And you know, I should qualify that when I talk about a failure, um, I'm talking about anything, anything right. gone wrong. Um, and I mean, that I, it's valid to do that, but I think it's also valid to realize that if you were to be building your own computer at home and you realize that your COM port header on the motherboard doesn't work, you would just say, well, I don't use a COM port header and, and uh, keep going. But you know, as someone that builds these PCs, we can't. We have to treat any problem as a failure and the motherboard just has more that can go wrong. What kind of failure, when you say it's the most, it's the, it's the component you see fail the most often, is it 5%, is it 20%, is it 2% of the machines yeah. that go out? Well, on average it's about, uh, I have the stats here in front of me, on average it's about 12%. Wow! Uh, but it's, it's very, it, it's, motherboard is also the most diverse of all the categories. We have some units that are 2%, and we have some that are 60. 60% 60 failure rate on a new motherboard. It's, it's crazy. We see consistent failure rates across the different brands. Really? Uh, where we see a lot of the differences is actually, um, well, first of all, the number of features on the motherboard. If you have, um, you know, an extreme series motherboard that has, you know, 20 USB ports and it has every sort of little controller, RAID controller and SAS controller on it, there are just more things to go wrong. And it seems natural that they, those would fail more often. Would that happen to be Intel motherboards that have the 2% failure rate? It seems to have a lot less to do with the brand. Uh, we don't see a lot of variation from brand, but more um, the chipset is actually a big deal. Um, if you look at, um, you know, I, I don't like slamming any companies, but uh, maybe we'll, we'll do it the inverse. We'll, we'll talk good. Intel. Uh, Intel chipsets is where we see a dramatically higher reliability. Um, we're talking an order of magnitude of four times more reliable. Um, from Intel chipsets. No kidding. So if motherboards are the, the most likely component to fail, what's the next most likely component to fail? The ne next most likely uh, for us, and this might be atypical, but it's video cards. Hmm. And the reason I say it may be atypical is because specifically it's the high-end, high-power video cards that fail more often. I think they're pushing the, the hardware to a further extreme and that that just opens it up for problems. So it's more, more, it's not like the giant heat sinks they attach to these are yanking them out of the slots so they're bouncing around inside the case. It's actually physical failures maybe due to heat on the, on the GPU itself? Yeah, well they are, they're certainly more susceptible to shipping problems, but the vast majority of the failures that we find are failures in our shop during the burn-in process of our, after we build the computer. What's the most reliable thing? I mean, cases, are they the most reliable components? Or? <laughs> right. Well, you know, when I ran the stats, I, I deliberately pulled out things like cases. Um, keyboards, keyboards are very reliable. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the one that, that I think is most important is CPUs. 
Uh, really? CPUs by far are more reliable than anything else in your system. Less than a 2% failure rate, a 1% failure rate, or? Uh, it's a 0.9% overall. Wow. So I guess we've kind of like taken care of all of the socket issues we had in the past and the. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, some some of them have. Uh, we, we do see a big spread. We see uh, with Intel CPUs, we see a 0.6% uh -huh. overall failure rate. And with AMD, we still see a 1.9% uh, failure rate. And for the most part, yeah, it's, you know, bent pins, uh, that type of thing, um, where they're just more susceptible to that type of damage. So how about, how about one of the most problematic components for a lot of people, hard drives? Any, any stats particularly stand out on hard drives? You know, hard drives are really boring. Uh, we, see, we see equal failure rates. Uh, the industry, or the average for us is around 3%. Mm -hmm. And we see 3% from Western Digital, Samsung, Maxter, Seagate. Uh, Hitachi is a little bit higher, but we only used Hitachi for the really high-end drives, so that might, be, that might be a thrown off. We see equal failure rates between solid states and um, traditional hard drives. They're all wow. around 3%. So basically, the industry, the hard drive industry, is pretty. Uh, everybody's pretty equal at this point. <laughs> it's pretty standard. Yeah. The only the only jump out that I saw was in the uh, the cheaper, the lower end solid state hard drives. Um, I think those have already gotten a pretty bad rap in the industry. Of well, mm -hmm. those aren't the solid state drives you want. But just as reassurance of that, we we measure a 15% failure rate on those hard drives. How about power supply units? Mm hmm. Uh, power supply is kind of in the middle. We see about a 6% of failure rate. Um, it's fairly standard across the, the different companies. We don't have actually a lot of experience with very many companies. We, we've worked with Intermax, mm -hmm. Seasonic, and Corsair. Um, Corsair is the lowest failure rate, but only when you factor in um, some bad manufacturing batches. Uh, we've had a couple instances where we've had uh, huge batches, hundreds and hundreds of units that had a buzzing noise to them. Uh -huh. So we consider those failed. That really bumps up the failure rates for Corsair. But it was a single isolated issue, and once you push that aside, they, they're the most reliable units we've seen. I, I gotta ask, because people are gonna ask me if I don't, are there any brands you absolutely avoid when you're building a system? I understand if you can't answer that question, but are there certain like logos you see and like hives start popping up? <laughs> Yeah, there are there are there are a couple. Um, I, I guess what my advice would be is the the more hype you see and the and the more like extreme or if they use the word fatality or uh, <laughs> when, when that happens, you know that the marketing team has a bigger voice than the engineers and you know something's wrong. Oh my goodness, John, this is awesome information. Thank you so much for sharing this with the crew here at Techzilla. Ladies and gentlemen, PugentSystems.com is the website to build nice machines. I've seen them. Go check it out. John, thank you again for taking the time to talk to us today. No problem. Thank you. Squarespace.com, people, they've been a sponsor of Techzilla here for a while. They're a publishing system. You're looking to build a blog, portfolio, any kind of website, they're a really good place to go. Why? It's simple, it's painless, even for me. My wife actually mocks my terminal fail when it comes to building websites. She enjoys mocking me, but she also admired Squarespace's system. She actually used it to import her WordPress page without any pain, and she found that you could actually get a site up and running pretty quickly. No coding, the creation is fast, and there's a finite number of modules, which means you aren't spending forever searching through piles of weird little things that people have designed to run on some system. You know if they work, you know if they don't, you can check them quickly without spending a lot of time messing around. And now, I mentioned Squarespace, they have the, the site importer tool. It does work with WordPress, Blogger, Typebed, Movable Type. And it's really simple and really easy. Matter of fact, I'm actually using it to build my own website myself, which everybody can email in and mock me about once I have it up and running. It's really simple. Do us a favor. If you decide to use Squarespace to hold your website, use the code TECHZILLA. You'll actually get us credit, but more importantly, get you 10% off the lifetime of your order. Heads up, it's not going to happen on the initial tryout when you first go there, but a few days later, if you decide to purchase and stick with Squarespace, do us a favor. When you make that order, use that TechZilla code. Again, they're one of our sponsors. We'd love it if you tried them out. Squarespace.com. Looks like it's time for another website we just can't get enough of. A website that we just can't stay away from because it's too useful, too funny, and it's too darn irresistible. This week's pick, Instant Jury. While the prevalence of smartphones on the market has made it very easy to quickly and decisively end debates centered around cold, hard facts, what do you do when the issue at hand is a bit more ambiguous? Well, you put your debate up on Instant Jury, of course. After making an account, you state your side of the case, and then your friend does the same via their own account. 
This way, you don't have to worry about the case being one-sided depending on who submits it. Then other registered users of Vincent Jury get to vote on which side they think is in the right and leave comments saying why they picked the side they did. This is a fun and fast way to solve disputes between roommates, coworkers, or family members. One of my favorite aspects of the site is getting to see what the wagers are on the cases. A shot at the local bar, cleaning a litter box for a month, a lot rides on your vote. So put the power of the people into your hands today. Check out instantjury.com. Patrick and I both basically live on Dropbox, so he was all over this question from Nick, who writes, I'd like to make Dropbox portable as an install Dropbox on a USB key, have my sync folder on the USB key, and be prompted for a login every time I run it. Also, is it possible to run multiple instances slash accounts of Dropbox on the same PC? Nick. Well, if anyone hasn't heard of us yakking on about it, Dropbox is a pretty nifty application for syncing files across your PCs, Mac, or Linux boxes for that matter. I've got it set up, I think, on like five different machines mm -hmm. around the house just in case I need a file from one place and drag it to the other and sharing files desktop, with other people. My work notebook, my home All desktop, my, netbooks. my second home desktop, my home, both my home yeah, notebooks. Yeah, we've got, I've got it on two Macs at home, <laughs> my, my main Mac and then our, the podcasting Mac. I've got it on two netbooks and mm -hmm. then Ryan has it on his machine. So that's at least five or possibly even six computers There's probably at home. like 12 between, the, at least 12 machines just between the two of us. If you haven't used it, right, it's, it's, handy. it's really simple. You download the client, you open your account, you enter your name and password, and basically anytime you alter a file saved on any one of your Dropbox and you save a file, delete a file, make a change to a file that's saved on there, it basically automatically changes it to all your other machines. Dropboxing, huh? Yeah. Is that the official term? Well, it was really I like funny. That. Like, I, there's more on that in a second. Oh. Two gigabytes of storage for free, which is a lot of Texilla scripts, and then it's uh, 50 gigabytes for 10 bucks a month. And you get a little bit extra if you mm -hmm. if you refer people to the service. Ooh. They'll actually like give you a little bump up in your in your space for free. Email me if you're so looking to try us. it out. So Use us as your referrers, guys. <laughs> okay. So I was sitting there and I'm like, Nick, dude, you can access your Dropbox off any machine by logging into Dropbox.com. And so I'm scratching my head thinking like, why would you want to, you know, it's, it's easy, right? You log in, you type in, you go, you're good. And I'm like, oh, duh, here's why you need to sync your files to a thumb drive. So you can access them when you don't have an internet connection or carry them from computer to computer so you don't have to download them first to work on them. And or more if he's ideas, on shared computers shared too, computer. that maybe he wants to, to use it for a short period of time but doesn't want to take that chance right. that even if he deletes it, somehow the files will still be there or people will be able to access it. So we get it. We get it. It's yeah, a good especially reason. Especially always remember to log out when you're on public or rented or, or anything like that. Yeah, it's just close. I, I close everything out like every night and every time I leave my machine half the time. We also used to have one of those evil Here? people. Yeah. Ooh. There was an incident at a place I used to work at that nearly got somebody fired. It was a great email, but it was evil. It was, <laughs> it was I, I can't talk about it. Okay. Anyhow, hopefully you, you <laughs> use a Windows box, Nick. If you do, download Dropbox Portable from the Dropbox forums. You're also going to need to download and install Windows.net Framework 3.5 if it isn't already running on your system. And if you're not a programmer, it's probably not. By the way, if you're in Windows 7 like I was, you're going to go through this really frustrating experience of downloading 3.5, like Windows.NET Framework 3.5, and installing it, and then weird stuff's going to happen. And finally, a menu's eventually <laughs> going to pop up that says, oh, you need to go to Control Panel Programs, turn Windows features on or off to actually open up. In the, you'll see a big smirch where Windows you know, .NET 3.5 is, is in that control panel, and you have to check. Basically, I checked both of those boxes. And I love how just running. weird stuff happens, and you move on. <laughs> Well, it's laughing. Story of I'm my like, life. You know, this, this, I'm like, you know, this shouldn't be. Well, it's just, just make sure you have .NET 3.5 running. So, once you've done that, you download the Dropbox uh, Portable. You unpack the zip file on your thumb drive. Double click on Dropbox Portable and follow the installation instructions that pop up on your screen. It gets a little weird, right? Because essentially, the Dropbox Portable is a script launches the Dropbox installer, and you go through all the Dropbox installer instructions up to a certain point and mm -hmm. then you hit quit on the menu box that pops up and it finishes everything off. It's just a little just pay attention. So it's kind of like a weird a weird hack to the install. Yeah. Yeah, in it's a, way. a weird hack. Once Not a hack just, you know. Yeah. Once the portable installation is finished, your files just automatically start copying over to your thumb drive. What it doesn't do, so when you move it to another machine, right, you plug it in, all your files are there, nothing happens. Mm -hmm. Now, then you need to launch, get Dropbox, basically you launch the Dropbox portable application on your thumb drive mm -hmm. if you want to sync between okay. your thumb drive Dropbox and all the rest of your Dropbox. That makes sense. So, yeah, and it's kind of funny. Basically, just double click on Dropbox portable, and I should say, if shared machines, you have to have the ability to run programs on that Windows box. If you can't run programs on that Windows box, 
uh, Dropbox and, well, I should say Dropbox. Do you need an, an admin password in order to, to run it? You should need an admin password, but some machines are locked down that. so yeah. that you can't run stuff off a thumb drive. Oh, by the way, Dropboxing is the name of a Dropbox add-on, which Dropbox Portable is an add-on. Dropboxing mm -hmm. allows you to use multiple Dropbox clients concurrently. There's also a Linux and OS X hack too, but I'm not going to get it all happy with the command line on today's show, because it's a command line hack, as far as I can tell, for to run multiple concurrent Dropboxes simultaneously. Okay. There's, a, there's a, basically there's a there's an add-on for Windows, there's command line hacks for the Linuxes like Mac OS X and, and the various Linux mm -hmm. flavors. By the way, if you want a ridiculously cool Dropbox hacks, Dropbox hack, hack, hackson, hackser, check out the show notes for a link to control a BitTorrent client remotely. It's part of Maximum PC's five amazing mashups for Dropbox. And basically the idea is if you have a BitTorrent client at home that can monitor a folder, you make it monitor the right. Dropbox folder and then you basically drop the BitTorrent link into that folder and your BitTorrent client at home will automatically start downloading that legal content. That is sweet. Content. Yeah, I saw all those great that hacks that they had on the Maximum PC article a, few, uh, a couple months ago and I was yeah. like, I have to remember these. I got to go back and use them. There's some good ones in there. Lifehacker does a bunch of good ones. Um, the one thing I couldn't figure out how to do, Nick, was to password lock Dropbox. So I would say set up security on your thumb drive so it requires a password to log into your thumb drive, which you're going to need anyway because otherwise you just have your Dropbox folders all on your thumb drive that people can access. Yeah, we've talked about different password programs that you can use on USB thumb drives in the past. <laughs> so you can, you know, search back on, on older episodes and find some of those. You know what we haven't done in forever? What? We talked about like, oh, and there's a Dropbox U3 app if you're into the U3 applications. Huh. We talked about like portable apps and U3 apps for thumb drives. Yeah, I, I mean, there's so many you can run, you know, any web browser, like operating send systems. Send us your favorite portable applications for thumb drives. We'll put together something on that for you guys because we haven't done anything on that in forever. Yeah, that would, be a, that would be a really good one. Like, can you just take, could I just not even, huh? Could you live my, without my brain a piece? Is Could trying you live work, on like, a thumb drive? Alone. Like if I had like an eight gigabyte like cruiser, like Sandus cruiser thumb drive, could I just put everything, all the apps I could possibly ever need on there? I've actually seen Sorry, people just, try to run I'm World of Warcraft of like, on a thumb drive before, so I'm trying of, to figure out if I could do that. And then, instead of Veronica versus Wild, where we send you to like you know insert name of horrible jungle, and you're like killing millipedes don't put me outside. to survive. I don't want to go outside. You can be like, we took Veronica Belmont, gave her a thumb drive, packed with her favorite applications. Will she be able to stay employed and keep in touch with her friends and family without the use of a dedicated personal computer? <laughs> Coming up next, Veronica's handpicked a pair of viewer questions for you. But first. Being the tech support for your friends and families can be a thankless job. And if you have to do it remotely over the phone, it can get so much worse, which is why I'm glad there's a service like our sponsor, GoToAssist Express. GoToAssist Express can make the process painless for everyone. It doesn't matter if you're on a PC and the person you're helping is on a Mac or vice versa. No matter what, you'll be able to share their screen, transfer files back and forth, and fix whatever needs fixing, all from the comfort of your own home. No complicated installs, no weird setups, no hassle. Now, I've been using it myself for a few months, and it has made those tech help sessions about a million times easier. Instead of writing out emails trying to explain what to do or sitting there forever on the phone describing things, I can just send them an email or I am with my GoToAssist invite, and I'm in. I can make all my fixes to their computer, and they get the benefit of seeing exactly what I'm doing. So maybe next time they can take care of the problem themselves. Of course, if you're still not convinced, you can try out GoToAssist Express free for 30 days. 30 days to see how much easier it can be to help friends and family with their computer issues using GoToAssist Express. Just visit GoToAssist.com slash Texilla to start your free 30-day trial. And remember, by supporting our sponsors, you're helping to support Texilla. Time for the emails! Actually, you need to hold this for a second. It's okay. It'll be comforting. Why? Because Roger says you can't take that home until you pay for it. But he did not say that. You didn't see it? He didn't say that. It was in the script in the A block. You just read right over checkbook. it. I <laughs> Think he takes checks? Roger? He's like, give me cash, <laughs> lady. All right. Time for some emails. The first one is from Jake. Who writes, my mom currently has an older MacBook without the integrated webcam, and she'd like to try to do some Skyping with various family members. I did some preliminary research, and it didn't look like this could be done easily and cheaply. One or the other was fine, but both was a problem. Is my research wrong? Is there a good way to do this that is reliable and costs around $20 to $30? Jake, yes. Actually, <laughs> your research was wrong. 
Well, first Sorry. of all, <laughs> Skyping doesn't necessarily imply video, right? Because you can still do the audio stuff on Skype without. Well, I imagine she probably wants to talk to her grandkids and, like, you know, do the thing. So it's a video conference. She wants some Skype. video conferencing. Or maybe she has her own business and she wants to do video conferencing for meetings. I don't know. Bring I'm not going to make assumptions. And 30 bucks, I got to say, 30 bucks is a pretty tight cap. For, uh, it is, camps. but there are surprisingly a good number of options. Um, it can definitely be done. At the very worst, you might have to download some drivers for her laptop. A lot of webcams, even if they're only say they're for Windows, actually, Somebody once you download a, the drivers, uh, they work. They pretty much work fine. A lot of them just plug yeah, in they're, they're and they're good devices. to go. Yeah, USB devices, you can pretty much plug and play, stick them in your Mac, and they work fine. Um, uh, the price, like you said, does limit things a tiny speck, but not really that much. Uh, Skype actually links to a page that shows all the cameras compatible with Macs and what the drivers you need might be at webcam-osx.sourceforge.net slash cameras slash index.php. I wonder if they have one of those for the 720p cameras. I don't know. I don't know. I, yeah, right I didn't check that. Right now they're like, go to our store. We have all the camera information in the store. Oh, no, yeah. <laughs> well, Only you these know. cameras are compatible. They probably get a store. tidy little profit off the things that are sold yeah, on there. Think. Yeah, think. <laughs> um, unfortunately, they don't list the prices that work with you know the, all that. They have this big list of cameras, and it shows the drivers, and if it should work, or if it definitely works, and right. all the product names and numbers. But then it doesn't give the price. I'm like, if they could have just added that one little column, it would have made my job a lot easier. Well, then they have to figure out how to make it automatically update because you know the price is yeah every that's five true minutes, well, I could have so. done a price grabber integration somehow in the column there I don't know they were probably figure exhausted once they figured out the cameras that were making my job hard <laughs> what are your picks but then? anyway um, some options that I've picked out for you based on you know products that I've used in the past or at least brands that I trust on some level um, creatives live cam notebook I love products that have an exclamation point in them <laughs> you know it's like creative live cam notebook it's about thirty dollars you can get on the creative store. Um, D-Link, the Visual Stream DSB-C110, it's around $20. There weren't too many new ones out there, but you can definitely get a used right. one. Um, Logitech Quick Cam, the chat web camera, is $39.99, but they did have a few used ones for around $24. Um, you can probably find that. You know, Logitech yeah. cameras, I have a feeling, will work in general. I've always, I've tried a lot of Logitech cameras with my Mac in the past, and they've always worked pretty decently. Um, I'm sure the viewers have other recommendations for inexpensive cameras that they've used successfully with their Macs as well. I do have and to say you. something. Probably, if mom doesn't have a headset with a microphone, like you know. You well, it's going to have the integrated mic. But then you get that whole, if you have the integrated mic in the notebook and you try to talk over Skype, then you get the big echoey thing. Well, if you, all right, so if she has earbuds, right. I've done this actually for like televised, like Where news broadcasts. do the audio broadcasts. out into the earbuds. <laughs> yeah, sometimes uh, the choice between doing the, the earbuds and the onboard mic right. versus using um, whatever crappy headset happened to be laying around the office, mm -hmm. I actually went with the internal mic instead and it sounded a lot better. So you might want to test it and see how it sounds. You know, your experience may vary. Um, oh, and awesomely, the Xbox Live Vision camera also works with Macs. Really? And that thing's like between $15 and $20. Oh. Just plug it in and it works. It's a USB That's camera. A good I no. mean, it just works. That's a nice thing about USB. Our final question comes from CP in Romania. He writes, hello, Patrick and Veronica. Is it safe to charge a laptop using a different charger than the one that it came with? Mm. What is the worst that could possibly happen? Dun, dun, dun. I charge an Aspire one with another charger from a bigger 17-inch Acer Aspire 7730G. Nothing bad happened. It worked. Was it safe? Thank you, CP from Romania. Dear God, man, you're lucky to still be alive. No, actually, he's kidding you. If your laptop <laughs> charge and is working normally, I, I probably wouldn't worry about it too much. Your laptop bursts into flames, and guess what? Something bad Probably happened. an issue. I've, you know, cell phones are great because a lot of times they have, you know, a, a, a mini USB or micro USB charger. Just plug in it in there, it works fine. I've, I have so many different chargers and cables and things at home that sometimes you just don't really know what yeah. came with which and so you just start testing things and you know it's not unusual for the power adapters for several different notebooks from the same manufacturer to have the same specs and work just fine across all those different models so like you're you're fine you need a large notebooks yeah, so as long as your replacement power supply delivers the correct voltage and delivers enough amperage for your laptop, and it has the same connector, of course, don't try to force it. If you plug it in and for some reason it's not quite right or there's no, like, I don't know, if it doesn't fit right. The only time to get really paranoid is if you have, like, this, you know, like, the plug looks like it fits, but the 
the device itself isn't labeled because there's nothing worse than finding out like the pin uh, the pinout voltage is is, is reversed the polarity is reversed I should say the pinout polarity is reversed and you know for some reason it's center positive instead of the center negative well how Oops. would you know that how well, would you be able to tell generally if you were speaking in that, like that there situation? should be there's usually information on the back of the power supply that tells mm -hmm. you the input voltage is going to be like 120 or 250 volts and the output voltage in amperage that it's rated for. Yeah. That's usually on the back of the power supply somewhere. And then usually it'll tell you, it'll tell you sort of the ring and the pin voltage if mm -hmm. it's a you know, traditional plug type adapter. Um, and just, you know, if, if, it's, if it's like a universal notebook adapter, you're probably fine. Just double check it just to be case. They should, they should have information in there. And what would happen if he used one that had <laughs> too much voltage? Well, I mean, the, the overvolt, I mean, it depends on how much. The, the, the thing is, is usually your electronics will deal with sort of a variation in voltage. Mm -hmm. your, your power supply on your computer is going to deal with it a right, little bit better than the innards of your notebook. The power supply on your notebook is going to deal better with it than the actual charging device. If you have like the, the, the polarity reversed on the charger, your notebook should just kind of like not do anything. There should be a diode that blocks mm -hmm. the wrong uh, polarity from coming through. Um, you know, if you use like a five amp charger on a one and a half amp notebook, it, basically your notebook should just draw the amperage it needs and kind of ignore the rest. If you put like a 400 volt charger into a five volt notebook, in that case you may turn it into a giant sort of light display. Yeah. With the little, you know, the magic smoke will be released and it will never work again. No, I've done something recently. I, I have actually used the, um, a too high MagSafe battery for a, for a notebook that charger. wasn't supposed to take it. Charger, yeah. yeah. Because, like, you know, it's... What well, happens in that case? Generally nothing, right? Because, like, look, I've, I've had a dog pile of MagSafe chargers die. I think it's one of the worst designs ever. Um, I've, I've never had one die. I've had, I've seen, my wife's had four of them die. Three of them by the uh, little connector overheating. She's got one of the older MacBooks. Oh. And uh, one of the older, like, you know, like black MacBooks. And for some reason, it just, no matter what power supply we use, we've gone through three from Apple, two we bought ourselves. Um, and they mostly died due to the wiring and the wee little MagSafe connector falling apart or melting. Um, thing is, using a 60 watt power supply, on a on a MacBook Pro that wants that like 85 watt power supply, yeah, I've done that's that. That's not so good, <laughs> you know. And you touch it, you're like, my hand. I know, and the Apple know, logo is burned. I wonder. In place. I wonder sometimes why my battery died so quickly. I wonder if it's possibly because I left the wrong charger here at work and kept trying to plug my um, MacBook Pro into That'll a 60 it. watt power supply. That'll also probably <laughs> not do a lot for the life of the oh, charger. Ee, um, oh. Yeah. By the way, wattage equals voltage times amperage. So if you're looking at a, a universal charger that's like, I am. 120 watts, so you basically figure 120 watts divided by the voltage or the amperage equals the voltage or the amperage. So yeah, you're, you're missing like, it's like 5.1 watts for that 80 watt adapter and I want to say 85 watt adapter and 3.6 volts for the 60 watt adapter. So in closing, amps. they both run at like in summary, volts. if the charger fits, it's it, probably okay. It's probably okay. Just make sure if it's a universal charger that you set it to the right voltage. I just realized that I am going to London tomorrow, and I don't know where my sure universal you're... charger stuff is. <laughs> and that's going to be a problem. Well, you can <laughs> overpay for it in the airport. Oh, <laughs> yes, I've done we that have too many times. Booze for nothing and cigarettes for nothing, but that'll be 7,000% over the original price for that useful piece of electronics. Well, wish me luck. By the time you guys watch this, I'll be getting ready to come home anyway. <laughs> It'll be all over you in the future. You may have flung your laptop into the Thames, but you will be Maybe returning. I'll be coming back to a brand new MacBook Pro if they release one in the past, in the future. What will it have been? On Wednesday. Oh. Or maybe I'll want whatever tablet it is. I doubt it, but maybe. <laughs> you might. I don't think so. It might be the best thing ever. It might be. How I have many, a feeling that the, yeah. In the last, how long have we known you? Like they're gonna, three, they're gonna do that thing. Point? They're gonna do that thing where it's like, oh, I don't really need it. I don't really need it. And then, you're gonna and then buy they're gonna it. have that one thing that you're like, oh wow, that's kind of cool. And then you're like, maybe I do need it. And then you're like, no, that's stupid. So you own a MacBook Pro. Yes. You own iPods. I have a iPhone that okay. I use as an iPod. Did you previously own iPods? Yes. Um, I'm trying to think. Of what else is? Do you have an Apple TV? Yes. Do you, so basically. Don't you have, use it. Don't, Don't use, use it. it. <laughs> but you paid for it. Yes. <laughs> I'm just going to let this one go. I like technology of all different sorts. Someone, someone on the forums actually said, and I have a bone to pick with you, buddy, that I talk a lot of good stuff about Apple all the right. time. Yeah, I like Apple products, but I, I do not, by any stretch of the imagination, consider myself a fangirl. 
hello, I actually have more PCs than I have Macs at home. Like, I, I, I'm perfectly happy with PCs as well. I just, I just want to like, it'll be interesting next week. We will react to the Apple announcement, and you can you just remember. Steve Ferrari remember what I said this day. <laughs> it is recorded for posterity's sake. I are not fangirl. Oh, are we not? <laughs> I are lolcat. If you haven't seen instant messages on Revision 3, you're missing out. Think like Craigslist posts, best of Craigslist, I am conversations, lolcats. And then taking real, honest to goodness, professional actors, some serious cinematography, and mashing it all together. Matter of fact, a few weeks ago, episode eight, they had the school teacher from Mad Men, Abigail Spencer. It was amazing. You have to see it. Go to revision3.com slash instant messages right now. Try it out. I bet you will love it almost as much as Veronica loves whatever came out from Apple on Wednesday. Ha! 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 Love well, you watching. We live in your questions, so email us, techzilla at revision3.com. Tech help, product reviews, how tos You ask us, and we'll get it going for you. But if you don't ask us, we don't know what you want, so we need those emails, techzilla at revision3.com. We can't make this stuff up. We're not that smart. No. Hey, <laughs> even better, send us in a video question. Think of all the fun you can have and the admiration of all your friends and family when they see your mug on our show. Just keep it to 15 seconds, upload it to YouTube, and send us a link in an email with video question in the subject line. And as always, you can visit our forums at revision3.com slash forum. Share your thoughts, ideas, or comments with other fans of the show. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Veronica Belmont. Till next time, you've been watching Texilla. Does it bring the thunder? The f was that voice? And if you have to do it remotely over the phone, it can get that much more worse. That much worser, worse, worse. <laughs> Worsity, worse, worse. That's conversational. Worse dessert sauce. I match the Texilla logo. I match the Texilla logo. Match, 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 match. <laughs>